and welcome to the top 10 most likely unseen issues for the May 2018 strategic case study on online media sharing company CouchWeb. So before we start, I'm just going to go through a bit of an introduction to this particular video and where I've got the information on and what you need to do with said information. So how have I come up with these top 10? Well, first of all, you look at the focus in the precinct. If there's a lot of material in the pre-scene on a certain topic, then it's likely that there is some kind of importance of that topic. It's likely to be brought up in the exam, so there's more to talk about. And that feeds into the second point here, the degree of importance attached to it by the examiner. But that particular section extends beyond purely what's in the pre-scene, but also what SEMA like to examine. For example, ethics. It may be that there's no real mention of ethics in the case study, but ethics is considered very important by SEMA and therefore they are likely to examine it. Next is the strategic importance. How important is it to the organization? If a certain topic is very important to the company, for example, say uh, their suppliers, if they rely very heavily on a certain supplier, then it's likely that there might be an issue on the supply. If something were to happen to that supplier, what impact could that have on the business? And also, just a more general experience in doing these videos in creating mock exams and reviewing exams in the past, the typical kind of issues that come up and what kind of things have the examiner brought up in the past. And my final point here is about how easy it is to write issues on that subject. The people who write the exams are obviously people too, and they will go for ones that they know, go for ones that they know that they can write good questions on. So what do you need to do for these issues? Well, first of all, it's important to prepare key models. So this will be things like your SWOT exam, like uh, SWOT analysis, like your PESEL analysis, because building up this information now will help you to adapt the new information given you in the unseen or help you to have that, that context to apply the unseen material. Next thing you need to do is practice exam questions on these issues. And this will help you to understand the kind of questions that will be asked around these topics and how to answer them. And also this next session here, it will help you to plan these answers in your mind so that when you go into the exam and you start writing, you will already have uh, a background to in which to apply this new information. You'll already have certain points to bring up in your head as you're writing for them. And I've also put some more generic things here, such as the advantages and disadvantages of these certain topics, uh, where they would be used and how models can be used to support them. So let's move on to the top 10 issues now. And the first issue we're going to look at is a management issue. And essentially what I mean by a management issue is something that happens with the managers, with the directors, maybe they leave, also could link to staffing issues as well. And one of the reasons why I've chosen this as an issue is that staffing issues are incredibly common. They come up all the time in strategic case study exams. And also as strategic managers, we're at that level where we need to be thinking of the organization as a whole. We need to be thinking about all our different stakeholders, including employees, and how important they are to the organization. And of course, it mentions staff as being incredibly important to the organization in the pre-scene, and even came up in the risk report that losing key staff members would be very detrimental to the organization. It's a tech industry, a lot of demand for the kinds of people that we employ. You cannot just go to a local school and get a whole classroom full of school leavers at 16 years old or 17, whatever the school leaving age is where you are from, and just put them in to the IT department at a very high tech tech company and just say, do all this coding, do all this for us, because it doesn't work like that. A lot of the people that we will be employing, a lot of the people that have all the skills that we need to meet our requirements will be very highly trained, very highly skilled, and thus we need to keep them because we cannot just 
replace them that easily. And in this kind of industry, there's lots of headhunting going on. There's lots of other companies trying to get our employees. And that's why we need to keep them satisfied. From a more exam point of view or related to the exam, related to the syllabus, relating to the structure of the exam, 50% of marks on the exam relate to people and leadership skills. So much higher than at management and particularly at operational level. And a staffing issue and management issue links perfectly into both of these competencies. And therefore, it's very likely that the examiner will use some sort of management issue to test the or to test this particular competency, those particular competencies. And so likely issues could be perhaps the founders leaving, maybe Chet leaves, maybe Jen leaves, maybe Joe leaves, all these sorts of things that could happen. If all of them left, what on earth would we do? We don't seem to have a succession plan in place. There's no real human resource department at the organization, at least according to the pre-scene. So it could have... a a significant impact on the organization. They've been part of the organization for 20 years. They've been the driving force behind a lot of the innovation, a lot of the visions, objectives, and goals of the organization come top down in that functional structure from those founders. If they were to leave, it could leave the company with a significant power vacuum that it needs to fill. And that, of course, can lead to situations where the wrong people get put in power and things start to go wrong. It's particularly relevant for a public company because when the CEO, when the founders, when senior members of the board leave the organization, it has a real impact on the share price. And that will, of course, upset the shareholders who, of course, are key stakeholders. So again, we're tying back to the theme of stakeholders. Another issue could be staff asking for a pay rise or threatening to leave. And it's most likely to be the IT staff for the aforementioned reasons about how important IT staff are to the organization. We almost are in a position where if they ask for a pay rise or they'll leave, we have to grant it because, of course, they are so important. But then where does it stop? If we keep giving them, giving into them when, if, or whatever they ask, then will other staff start doing that? Will they keep doing it? And so on and so on. Obviously, if the organization as a whole's staff costs keep spiraling out of control, eventually that could cause problems for the organization as a whole. And that, of course, be bad because... It's all well and good giving people some more money, but if constantly giving people more and more money across the organization ends up issuing, oh, sorry, impacting the profit, impacting the dividends to shareholders, affecting the share price, all of that goes to affect the company as a whole negatively, which will, of course, in turn affect the employees. If the company were to end up going into debt, then it could be that some of them have to be made redundant or the company fails and they all lose their jobs. So it's a, a slippery slope sometimes to be too generous to giving in to demands. And of course, the company is constantly growing. And so, of course, we'll constantly need more and more staff. And so we have to make sure that we have quality staff members, that we train them effectively and that we only employ suitable people, people who are going to be loyal, people who have got the skills. And of course, again, all of this comes down to the human resources department. And what don't we have at the organization? A human resources department. So again, it's tying back to that need for human resources that I spoke about at length during the preceding videos that we do not have in the organization. And that could have a significant impact on the company. There's some key points to bring up here. The importance of staff to our strategy because it all links in with our culture. If people start leaving, people get unhappy, it affects the culture. As a tech company, we're more likely to have a far more dynamic, fast-paced, fun environment. And anything that damages this culture, damages this environment, could have a significant impact on our staff retention. More staff get unhappy, more staff leave. And as a result you go on to get more staff being unhappy and more staff leaving its snowballs. And of course, technology and innovation were mentioned as critical success factors, and therefore critical to be present within the organization at all times. And so losing staff who perhaps are good with technology, who drive technology, drive innovation, will be a negative thing for the business. And obviously losing management experience, a lot of 
management experience, particularly at the director level, is not trained. It's not learned in a book. It's intuition. It's experience. You can't just go to a university and get someone who's just fresh out of university with a PhD or an MBA with no real practical experience and expect them to be able to do the job as effectively. Just because they've got all the theory, just because they've got all the knowledge, they've got all the textbook knowledge doesn't mean they're actually going to be able to come into the business and be successful. And of course, there's always the cost and the difficulty in finding a replacement because of those reasons. Often the best people for the job will be people who are already employed as directors in other organizations. So are we going to be able to get them to come to our company? And as already mentioned, market confidence as well. It will affect the share price, particularly if some of the major directors, the founders, Chet, for example, were to leave the organization. And given that the share price is currently quite very high, $175 M dollars, if it were to plummet, then that could wipe billions off of the value of the company. And so some key theories to use when looking at management issues. Obviously, we have Menlo's matrix with key staff being key players. The board, the founders are key players to the organization. This gives them a lot of power, particularly during negotiation. They have a lot of interest in what we're doing and, of course, have a lot of power, which means that if they are upset for whatever reasons, we do perhaps need to take them more seriously than we would someone who was in a lower part of the Mendelow's matrix. And that's, of course, one of the main reasons why we use the Mendelow's matrix, because it allows us to rank the needs and wants of the various stakeholders. And of course, as well, we have various motivation theories, particularly more relevant to staff members, more operational staff members rather than directors, where you look at the differences between motivators and hygiene. The theory of Hertzberg being that hygiene factors are needed just to satisfy someone, just to keep people barely content. If they don't have good pay, they don't have good working conditions, good security, they'll be demotivated and want to leave. But they won't be motivated simply by having them because they expect them. Whereas motivators, generally, they won't be demotivated by not having them. They'll just be content. But you need to have them if you want to actually factually motivate people. Issue number nine is on foreign exchange. Again, something that I mentioned in the pre-scene analysis several times. And another reason why is because it's a key F3 and P3 topic, therefore likely to fall into your more technical and business categories in the competence charts. And so often, given the case studies are more focused, more geared towards E3 topics, whenever there's an opportunity to test a P3 or F topic, they often take it because otherwise it's far harder to fit P3 and F3 in. So it's a very common topic. It's appeared in many different variants, many different variants in the strategic case study exam. And the specific focus in the pre scene was that we were operating worldwide. It also broke down the amount of revenue generated from overseas sales. And it was significantly higher than in the domestic market in the mainland market. But of course, the profitability of the mainland market was higher, which suggests that either there are additional costs involved in overseas, although we would expect them to be fairly limited because it's not like a manufacturing company or a distribution company where dealing with a different location in the world requires far more logistics because it's just online. In theory, we can perhaps provide a service from one location all around the world because it's over the internet. So it could also be that the reason why it's not as profitable is we're losing some of that money with regards to the exchange rate. Perhaps the M dollar is particularly weak against certain currencies or particularly strong against certain currencies, and that's stopping some of our revenue. So like the issues could be specific contracts with perhaps potential providers, internet providers within certain countries to allow us the right to use use their systems to show our services or with particular consumers just in general agreeing with a particular country what price we're going to be charging consumers within that country for our particular product. So a rate being agreed in a foreign currency and needing to hedge against this change. 
And that's good because it will be testing knowledge of hedging techniques. Now, I will reiterate that you won't necessarily need to be able to do a hedge, a money market hedge, or at any sort of currency risk swap or anything like that, because the actual knowledge required or the, the knowledge that is examined with regards to these sorts of things will have been tested at P3 and F3. We're talking about it from a strategic point of view when it comes to the case study. That means we don't need to know how to do it necessarily. We just need to know why we would do it. What are the benefits of doing it? What are the benefits to our shareholders, to our organization of doing it? So what are some of these techniques? Well, obviously we have some of the the simple, the straightforward ones here, such as invoicing in home currency, which means where we always just charge in M dollars and we just get the 12 M dollars in our home currency. And it's up to the consumer themselves whether to take the, the loss or gain through exchange rates there. So the amount they pay may go up or down every month depending on what the current exchange rate is. We also have leading or lagging payments where of course we push back or we bring forward the times in which we receive payments, perhaps from the bank accounts within different countries that we are dealing, because we'll be using obviously individual bank accounts within individual countries, rather than everyone paying directly to our mainland bank. And we will be in a sense wanting to see a benefit from that. So we'll be bringing forward payment when we benefit and we pushing it back when we would benefit or when we predict that we will benefit from pushing it back. Other methods include netting, using forward and future rates as well to hedge against the losses that we may make. And of course, this will all go towards or will be recorded on our statement of financial position, particularly money market hedges. The positive or negative value of that will appear on our statement of financial position. But again, please don't spend time going through each of these in great detail, explaining how you would do them, because that is not what you are being tested on. We are looking at the use of hedging techniques from a strategic position, from a strategic standpoint. You won't get marks if you just explain what a money market hedges and so on. But the reason why it's all important is because a long term change in profitability may occur if it becomes consistently less profitable with regards to exchange rates if the M dollar is perhaps consistently weaker than other com uh, countries' currencies. And so another thing that we could do to plan for the future would be to look at the market predictions of particular industries or particular countries as we are entering into them and look at the possibility of perhaps diversifying internationally. What I mean by that is because I'm sure some of you will be thinking we're already diversified internationally. We're already trading in 100 different countries, but perhaps opening subsidiaries of Couchweb in these various different countries so that it's all done internally, domestically, in a sense. We don't have an international market in quite the same way anymore because we have simply domestic divisions within each country that we operate in. And so everything is done in that home currency. But of course, there may be issues there when with translation risk, because when the values of those different subsidiaries are translated back to the head office here in Mayland, we may still lose some of that value. So I hope you've enjoyed this sample video and more importantly found it useful. Before I go, I'd like to quickly tell you about a few of the products that we do here at Astranti Financial Training, specifically for our case study courses. We have a study text which details all the key theories in which you will be expected to use in your case study exam, as well as details of how to approach the pre-scene and the case study. We also have a series of course videos detailing how to answer case study questions. This is actually an area in which many students struggle. Most of the scripts that I've seen, the failing scripts that I've seen, has actually been due to poor case study technique rather than lack of knowledge. We also have a series of pre-scene analysis videos based on the current up-to-date pre-scene detailing all the key bits of information and likely issues you may face in the exam. 
Next up is the industry analysis, a pack detailing information about the industry that the precinct company resides in, information about the key players within that industry, and more background information on the industry in general. We also have a range of mock exams created for each level and based on the current precinct, which is a great way to get some practice in before you sit the real thing. We also offer marking and feedback on those mock exams so you can see where you are going wrong and where you can improve. Finally, we have the master classes. These are two one day classes taken by our expert tutors to give you all the, the hints and tips you need to really add to your chances of passing the exam. Also, if you take our full course, we offer a pass guarantee, which provided you have met all the requirements of the pass guarantee, you will get a free reset on the next exam should you fail to pass. So once again, thank you for your time. If you're interested in any of these products, please visit the website www.astranti.com for more information. Thank you.